There are times when death seems to be around every corner. No one can ever predict where this meeting will occur, in a cosy house on a desolate street, or this one may seem implausible to many of you, even over a family meal. Every story has an exception, though. One such story is that of Kenny Ong. Is it really feasible to do this? You inquire. How could an ordinary family dinner turn into a vicious murder that will shock Malaysians to the core and prompt the local government to even revisit the laws that are in place? Let's examine this instance. Kenny Ong Lake Yang is the heroine's full name. She was raised in a big family and was born in the Malaysian city of Ipoh in 1974. Furthermore, despite the fact that the city is regarded as a very interesting destination for tourists, Kenny had other dreams. What more could a young woman hope for than travelling and landing a prestigious job? Naturally, none of this could have happened by accident. She needed to work hard for her goal. She was aware of that. Kenny first received a gold medal for graduating from high school. She then attended a university in Hawaii and earned an economics degree there. After making a start, she needed to grow further, so she moved to Los Angeles, where she was hired by an advertising agency since she was already self-sufficient. The young girl gained self-realisation as an expert in her field in the city of dreams. Kenny first met Brandon Ong there in 2001. Like her father, he was born in Singapore, but immigrated to the United States with his family when he was a young boy, so he was now officially recognised as an American. Young Kenny and Brandon quickly got hitched and relocated to San Diego, a nearby city. But an accident occurred just two years into their relationship. Liver cancer struck Kenny's father. Kenny packed up her belongings and left her husband in America on June 1st to fly to her father in Malaysia, where her father was scheduled to undergo a major surgery. It was unclear if her father would survive the procedure. Thankfully, the surgery went well, the illness subsided, and the physicians guaranteed that Kenny's father, known as B. Jen, would live a long life and undoubtedly wait for grandchildren. Kenny let out a sigh of relief. It was safe at last to go back to her favourite job and her cherished husband. Kenny invited her extended family to a farewell dinner at their favourite restaurant, Monty's, where they had gone on holidays when Kenny still lived with her parents. She took an early morning flight to Los Angeles. Kenny's mother unexpectedly became ill during dinner and her loving daughter offered to take her home. She spent a long time searching her purse in the parking lot for a parking ticket, and when she couldn't find it, she concluded that she had just left it inside the car. Kenny hurried to the car after asking her sisters to keep an eye on her mother. She had been gone for a while. Even though her mother chose to go to the car herself, neither her daughter's nor Kenny's was there. Subsequently, one of the sisters attempted to contact Kenny's phone, but even more concerningly, it was discovered to be off. Kenny was well known within the family. She was too poor to just walk away, and even if something bad had happened, she would have called her family to let them know. But in a closed parking lot, only 300 feet away from her family, what could have gone wrong? Kenny's dad approached the security personnel and requested that they play the security tape. Nothing odd was present at first. His daughter was approaching the car, rummaging through her pockets and searching her purse for her keys. However, they soon saw that a stranger was trailing Kenny, and just like Kenny, he was accelerating and decelerating. The concerned father and the guards were already watching Kenny's car leave the parking lot from another camera. But there was a man behind the wheel, probably the same guy who had followed her in the parking lot. And oddly enough, Kenny was seated in the passenger seat. The family called the police right away because it appeared as though someone had been kidnapped. It should be noted that the Malaysian police started looking for the missing woman as soon as they learned about the stolen vehicle. A few hours later, a highway patrol member spotted a car that fit the description on the road. The police patrol stopped the car to look at the documents so as not to alarm the potential kidnapper. They weren't sure at the time if it was a kidnapping or not. The driver of the car pulled to a stop. He was obviously nervous, but he smiled and gave the policeman his licence. Kenny, who was seated beside him, tried to give the policeman some signs, but he was busy looking over the driver's paperwork. Sadly, he did not comprehend it, but the kidnapper took notice of it, floored the gas pedal and sped away from the patrol car. The car drove away when the police attempted to fire shots at the trail, but they were still in possession of the documents belonging to Ahmad Najib bin Aris, a 27-year-old kidnapper. Allow me to give you a brief overview of this man's life. Ahmad was raised in Muar, Malaysia, after being born there in 1976. 
He was the family's second of four siblings. Ahmad Najib completed his secondary education up to the third year of study before quitting, skipping the final two years. Because he was a hard worker who had to work to support his family, secondary education in Malaysia lasts for five years. He travelled from Muar to Kuala Lumpur in 1998. Ahmad Najib later got married and had a pair of kids. Ahmad Najib was a man of good character and a responsible worker, according to those who knew him. Let's return to our case now. It became apparent after some time that the shooting at the car had consequences. A young man came up to the police and related an odd tale. He claimed that while having dinner at a roadside cafe, an unidentified man approached him and said that he and his wife were going on vacation, but that they were unable to continue because he had punctured a tyre while driving. With pleasure, the young man chose to assist the stranger. They stepped outside. He removed a jack from the trunk and gave it to the traveller, but as he did so, he saw bullet marks on the vehicle and a terrified woman sitting in the front seat who didn't exactly look like a wife enjoying a carefree getaway with her husband. Instead of changing the tira, the so-called husband merrily played around with the jack for a little while. Sulked and returned it. The moment the police saw that it was Kenny, they knew Ahmad was the one who had abducted her. But that was the last time Kenny was reported as being alive. Three days later, Kenny Ong, or rather, her body, would be discovered nearly burnt to the ground in a sewer manhole next to a construction site. The woman was repeatedly stabbed in the stomach before being strangled, as the autopsy will reveal. Blood stains on the rear seat and a punctured or rather shot tyre can also be found in Kenny's car, not far from the construction site. It was only after the body was discovered that the police, who now had the killer's documents, made the strange decision to visit Ahmad's residence. The killer was at home, leading a perfectly normal life, as if nothing had happened, as if he had not stolen a car, abducted a woman who had come to visit her father while he was ill, and most importantly, as if he had not fled from the police officers who were firing at him. This is what makes this story so amazing. Forensic tests would later reveal, following Ahmad's apprehension, that the car contained not only Kenny's blood, but also Ahmad's own DNA. We would like to make it clear that murders especially those as brutal as this one, are incredibly uncommon in Malaysia. The point is that a murderer is entitled to the death penalty, which is the harshest punishment allowed by the criminal code, not even life in prison. Ahmad confessed to everything and even chose to assist with the investigation, presumably hoping that doing so would spare him from execution. It is unclear what he had hoped for, though, given that the police have all of the information about him. Of course, the vicious criminal disguising himself as a sheep. He claimed during the trial that he was mistakenly searching for a different woman that evening in the parking lot and didn't realise it until he was in the car with Kenny. He claimed that they had even laughed together about the predicament. Later, he made an attempt to get her to have sex with him, but once more, he claimed that Kenny was not even opposed to it and that the woman's death was caused by her own sexual fantasy, which is why she had the strangulation marks on her neck. Terrified, Ahmad made the decision to burn Kenny alive in order to get rid of the body. Given that Kenny had requested to be strangled during the intimate encounter, Ahmad would have only been awarded abuse of the deceased or, at most, negligent homicide. Therefore, Ahmad's lawyers concocted this entire story. The lawyers also argued that if this was all a lie and the captive's imagination, then why didn't she flee while her captor was changing the tire? If the abdomen stab wounds weren't present, this aversion might even seem plausible. At this point, the defence as a whole crumbled like a house of cards. It was clear because the investigation's version of events was distinct, more trustworthy, and corroborated by the autopsy. Ahmad followed a lone woman he noticed in the parking lot of Monty's restaurant. Kenny told her to get in the passenger seat, threatened her with a knife, and took the wheel himself when he opened her car. He took the car to a desolate spot, tucked a scared Kenny in the back seat, and used her multiple times after that run-in with the law and an unsuccessful attempt to fix a burst tyre. When Kenny attempted to resist, she was repeatedly stabbed in the stomach and then strangled with a coat belt. Ahmad took her already dead body outside after the abuse and threw it into the first manhole, hiding it with tyres to prevent it from being discovered. The following day, he came back to this manhole with multiple gasoline canisters and made the decision to finally cover up the evidence of the crime by dousing Kenny's body in gasoline and lighting it on fire. 
Ahmad also had four rapes against women, who fortunately did not die, as it turned out later, but he did not report them to the police out of fear of being found out. After a protracted trial, the court finally sentenced the murderer on February 23, 2005, giving Ahmad ten lashings among other punishments. Did this, however, make the parents who had lost their daughter for good feel any better? Ahmad attempted to challenge his sentence while he was incarcerated and even wrote the state's chief executive, Selangor, pleading for a pardon, but he was naturally turned down. And Ahmad finally got his just desserts, just 13 years after Kenny was killed. He was executed by hanging on September 23, 2016, inside his cell. Like I mentioned, this case received a lot of attention in Malaysia. The brutality of the murder itself and Ahmad's seeming naive belief in his impunity did not so much terrify the residents as the ease with which someone could be abducted in a busy shopping centre, even if it was just a parking lot. The Malaysian government started installing as many CCTV cameras as they could throughout the nation, hiring more security personnel for shopping malls and even designating parking spaces just for women in an effort to stop this from happening in the future. And given the circumstances, it is extremely pitiful that an innocent woman who travelled tens of thousands of miles to see her father had to give her life in order to justify such drastic measures.